Witam Państwa bardzo gorąco. Jestem zaszczycony tą, tym licznym tłumem. Pan profesor Rafi Segal, którego będą Państwo radzić, jest zachwycony obecnością. W całej jego szkole nie ma tylu studentów, ile zawsze podkreśla, ile przychodzi na jego wykłady, wykłady w, w Krakowie. Ja nie będę przedłużał. Zapraszamy Rafi. The floor is yours. Right. Uh, architecture as dialogue is what I would like to talk to you about today to show some of my work, but to also explain a little bit how, how I understand architecture, how I understand design, and in what way uh, this, these understandings can be kind of communicated. When I say architecture is dialogue, it means that we don't always know in advance what we will do in a, in a project. We begin a, a project in a kind of conversation. It's a conversation between uh, the building and the site, between uh, mass and void, uh, between different parts of a building, uh, between different spaces inside a building, between a sketch and a model, or between a sketch and, and a drawing, and between a drawing and a building, uh, between a geometry uh, and the spaces that we design. But it's also a, a conversation that we have with ourselves as designers. It's a constant back and forth that we do something we're not sure of. Uh, then we kind of translate that into a different medium, uh, and, and so forth. And it's an ongoing discussion. And as the project advances uh, into building, uh, this dialogue expands, and it becomes a dialogue between a designer and a user, between a contractor, between consultants, and eventually between the city and you as, as creative people that contribute to the city. So I, I, I'd like to share some, some concepts here to better explain this idea, the move or the the dialogue we have between concept form, between sketch drawing, between object city, between user designer, um, between building and design, between figure and ground, between mass and void, between structure and envelope. And I know that in classes this is discussed. You do the structure, then how does it impact the envelope? So this is a back and forth. It's not one thing comes before the other. It's, it's, a, it's a dialogue, right? So now, these concepts, understood in the broader context, yeah, that architecture does not take place in a void, in an abstract world. It takes place in response to collective ideas that live in and with society, or what we envision or imagine society to be. So the architecture work is created out of a dialogue between these concepts. And what I, uh, what I would like to leave you with this idea that when you as a designer, when I as an architect find a balance between these forces, that's where architecture happens. So when there will be also uh, images of, of projects, this is just <laughs> a little bit of an introduction to share some kind of thinking, yeah? So when I begin a project, first of all I ask what uh, or how can, can the site that the project will happen benefit from the building and how can the building benefit from the site? It's a two-way condition. Right? One more word about program, which I know we are in a way, we study with this understanding that um, program or the purpose of the building or the use of it dictates the shape. But at the same time, we need to remember that over, over time, and you know this well if you're in, in this city, um, most often the program will change uh, much quicker than, than the design. So the program will change much quicker than the form will change. The form usually stays. 
So we also have to think of that when we, when we design, that the form is there and it's doing more, right, than, than serving that program at that given time. Um, can we just get, turn the lights off again? I have some drawings and it will, yes, just the lights, can we, right, okay, thank you. Okay, um, I'll start with a project that is in the city. It was a competition for what uh, was called Planet Lem. Uh, you are familiar with this map. I don't need to explain where we are. But the project is situated in an area, you know, across the river in this structure, which is a, was a salt warehouse. And you can see some images from 100 years ago, from 40 years ago, and so forth from today. Uh, this is the building. So the competition called for what they said a literary center, a museum for Stanislav Lem, a science fiction writer, not, not of your age, but perhaps still known. Uh, but the requirement was to keep this building there. As you can see, not, not a great building, but I guess had some historical significance. Uh, it was designed as a salt warehouse, yeah, storage but now it's supposed to become a museum. Uh, so there were guidelines uh, in English and in Polish, yes. And the guidelines basically said, oh, you, can you have to keep the building. You can replace the roof because the roof is old, uh, but you can build a box here um, only up to 18 meters high. That was the guidelines, right? So we started with this dialogue between a building, an existing, and a new structure with the restrictions. How can the roof replaced become one? And so the logic became, yes, this is allowed, but this is kind of funny. If you build this thing like that behind a building, there is no conversation between the existing and the new. So maybe there is a movement of a roof that expands and grows. And in this, we cut a courtyard because it's First of all, a way to organize the space, right? And this is such an enormous kind of space behind. But also it responds to that demand to keep an opening there. So you see the first, the first uh, move is not, was not about the program. The first move was about that conversation between an existing building and a new building. Now you create a reality and now you have to make it work uh, with the program. As you know, you know, you take the program, you organize it in, in boxes or such, and now it has to, you have to find a way to fit it, to make it work, maybe in this way or that way. Um, and this is kind of interesting because this is what we do, right? We give ourselves kind of these puzzles or these kind of challenges. Or, in other words, we also enjoy this conversation we have with ourselves as we design. So this gets translated into a circular movement and boxes on the perimeter, and it's all covered by one roof. So as you enter the existing building, the first thing you, you experience is that view into the garden around which everything is organized. So we put emphasis into the drawing also of the garden, right, of this kind of center space. So you see very clearly, you can read the different structure of an existing building and a new, but you can also see the porosity and connectivity, right, between the new and, and the existing, and the, how important the courtyard is to allow this connection to happen. Because sometimes between forms, we need space. We need, like between words, we need a pause. So in this case also, between the old and the new, we need, we need a pause. And the circulation in the, in the perimeter of the courtyard, very simple concept, uh, very, very typical in a way of a courtyard system, uh, gives us that flexibility. And also this experience that you walk into the new building around in a, in a kind of around the courtyard and, and you kind of connect all the different parts of the building. Uh, you, can see, you can see the model of the roof structure continue. And so the plaza in the front, and the way that the building kind of organizes itself and in relation to, to the city and so forth. So the idea of uh, 
a program being this abstract thing in the context of a museum or an art gallery is something that I've been working with. Uh, in this project, you see the idea of exhibition has is, is changed very different over the past 200 years. In, in the 19th century, the concept of uh, collection was very different, as you can see in this image. Uh, but uh, 20th century art, modern art, would like to have this white cube, this kind of open, abstract space, um, clean, white, for, for the artist. It creates a different kind of interaction, right? So this idea of a, of a white cube informs this next project, uh, which is a museum in the city, port city of Ashdod in, in Israel. So the, the building uh, here uh, was existing. It was, uh, it was a shopping mall. It was designed for a shopping mall. Uh, but then they decided that they actually need a museum, so they wanted to transform that into a museum, but the, they had a kind of glass pyramid over it, which they thought, well, glass pyramid is already a beginning. So again, a relationship or a conversation with an existing building, not great in this case, uh, but something we need to work with. So the object or the architecture was not dependent on the existing structure, which was not designed for a museum, but on the gallery, on the unit, on that box, right? So we designed the box. Um, but then obviously, one is not enough. So there are many boxes. And those boxes stack up in the space and then create a series of small galleries, white galleries or white cubes, uh, that one kind of moves between and artists take up each box and the curator can play with what happens inside the boxes and what happens in between the boxes, which becomes also a kind of space to use, right? So this dialogue of inside and outside, inside the white cube, in between the white cube. You would have art inside and some meat and you would have art outside and you then people would kind of move in between these spaces as they visit the museum inside the white cube, which has a lot of light and in between. Because some contemporary artists like to have that space in between, that, that weird kind of space in between. Just to give you a sense where, where this is all happening, this is in Israel, uh, which is um, on the eastern side of the Mediterranean. Um, not far from Ashdod, which is down here. If we go a little bit, about 40 minute drive, we get to, to Tel Aviv, a city designed in the early 20th century based on a plan by Petra Geddes, uh, which followed kind of ideas of the Garden City movement. So basically, uh, well, a small city that is organized around green space, uh, which is uh, quite, quite uh, lovely in a way, very human in scale, but most streets uh, have green uh, and, and very kind of pedestrian friendly, you know, warm climate, etc. And so in this uh, area in the north of Tel Aviv, uh, I designed with the city hacker who uh, went to this school, by the way, <laughs> maybe 70, maybe more than 70 years ago. Um, a history museum for what, what we call a Palmach, which is uh, in a way uh, an underground um, military organization that existed prior to the establishment of the state of Israel. What is important to know about this project is that the, it's right near the Tel Aviv University campus, as you can see up in this image. And, and like many campuses that are designed as object buildings set in a, in a park, right, in green space. This project being one right next to that, but also in a way representing uh, an organization, let's say, that does not exist anymore, uh, led to the kind of concept of 
can we engage the existing landscape in a different way? Can we have a dialogue with the landscape, not just as a flat piece of grass where you put buildings on? And I, I think this is critical also to understand that architecture is always a critical act. It always questions what, what is existing. If you have a client uh, that wants one thing, our role in a way is to question that. If you have a program or a brief that, that is asking for something, our role is kind of to question, not, not to resist, uh, to, que to question in a productive way, in a constructive way. Because otherwise, I don't think we really need designers or need architects, because building can happen also without, without architects. What we're committed to, or I, I feel that architects need, or their responsibility is, is to constantly kind of question and kind of challenge and be critical of, of what we build. That's the way that we advance our art, right? So here, the context of a, of a university campus that had these object buildings and to create a, a project that had a different kind of interaction with, with the landscape is really what, what we were looking for. And so the site existed like this, uh, with these trees in the middle, and, and you see a kind of a sandstone. And so the first act was to carve out space around these, these buildings. Now the, the earth on which the building, the, the trees are, that, that earth is, it goes all the way down. There is, no, there is no construction under it. There's just a carving of the space around it. And so the building is constructed around this courtyard, right? And that stays as was. So another kind of conversation between the landscape and a building, where the landscape hides, or the building hides the landscape but reveals it, and the landscape is contained in the building but also passes, passes through it. Another kind of dialogue that's happening here is between the ruins of war or the acts of, of war on architecture, right? In this kind of series of images uh, by a photographer friend, you see these kind of elements of, of a war architecture but these are also kind of echoed in, in the concrete and in, in the stone and in the way that the building is, is designed. These were elements that were used in the actual digging of the site, but they're re reappropriated in the wall. Another idea is that relation with the local stone that is then carved and then from the site and then used on the building facades. So there are a few dialogues that are happening here in parallel. And also it's important to understand that it's not uh, on one level that we start a conversation where we say we want to have a conversation between a landscape and a structure, but then we develop that along the way. So it translates into the relation of stone to building, the relation of space, the relation of levels, the relation of where the windows are placed, etc. In this project uh, that is, is very different, it's a, it's a villa uh, in the town of Ordos in China, uh, a very different place, very different scale, very different context. Some of these ideas are translated, uh, the ideas I showed you in the Palmach Museum, into this project. The site is obviously very different. It's uh, sand, it's a desert, uh, and it's a very ambitious master plan that created a hundred villa lots for a hundred different architects. You see that uh, I was given this one over here. Um, it, I, it was luck that I think I got it, but because it's on the edge. And this is an artist residency uh, and it really just sits here, between the edge of the neighborhood and this kind of open space. So, I mean, you have to ask yourself this question when you get one of these villas. I mean, what is different between this or that or this? Because they all look the same, right? And they all also have the same uh, guidelines or restrictions. 
And this is very typical to any villas. I think it have, it's in, in most places. You have a lot, let's say this size or that size. It's here, 1,500 square meters. Uh, you have setback lines, right? You see in that, uh, what is a setback? And then you have an idea of a footprint of the building. And then you need to create some green space. So the way that we think about a house in this context, or in a suburban context, but it happens quite often. We think of it as an object, as a freestanding object, usually in the middle, in the middle of a site. Uh, and, that, and that was kind of, uh, given, given the location that I showed you, that was kind of uh, an opportunity to challenge that idea. So rather than having a gray or an object in the middle of a site and green around it, can we have like the open space in the middle of the site and the object or the building around that open space, right? And can that relate also to the way that the sun moves and so forth? So you see an initial uh, investigation into this idea of the whole lot being a building and open space carved into it. You see, I, I, I like this idea of carving and creating space out of, out of mass or out of, out of a structure, right? This kind of play of inside, outside. So you see the gray here represents the in-between open space and the colors are different exterior programs. And then the building of the house is around those exterior programs or exterior courtyards, multiple courtyards, right? That the, the building is organized around. And so you walk through that space on both sides and it creates that, that opening towards that open space that you saw in the, in the site plan. Now this presents a challenge because the green arrow is a desire to kind of walk through the building, right? If you put the open space in the middle, you want to walk through it. But then how do you connect the different parts of what is supposed to be one house? And this is where the red kind of loop comes in. So this is really what we have, and we always need to remember that what we have as, the, as architects is space. <laughs> and I mean that, that we can work in section, that we can start at this level, we can go up and go across and go back down and create continuity in space. We don't have to create always continuity on the same level. And this is that single idea that allowed this project to happen. Because then on the ground level of the building, you see you can walk through it. But you see the both stairs on both sides, stairs and stairs. Right? So on the second level, you can connect here. But also on the basement, you can connect here. Right? Through and we have a nice like pool there. Right? So this is how it works in section. You, the lower level connects with the middle ground level through the upper level in section in a loop, and the, the ground level remains open for access. Now all this happens in an idea or in a concept and does not require any materiality, right? This could be just space. It could be concrete, it could be wood, it could be anything. It's a spatial concept. But, you know, when we design something, we, ha we give it a material. It's not only all, always predetermined. And this is also, uh, for me, I don't, uh, usually I would start with a form or with a concept. I wouldn't start with a material. Uh, in this case, I thought, oh, this is a this is an interesting plan, but now how do you kind of shape it into a building? So, you know, we made, I made a model. Uh, we, made, we made a few models. We think that models will help us uh, understand more. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Uh, sometimes it comes in unexpected ways, like in this very small model that was made by uh, a Z-Core plotter. You see, they uh, created these lines. So the model, the, the way the model was made here by a robot, 
made these lines, and I said, oh, this is kind of interesting, these lines, you know. And then I noticed that actually the way that I was kind of drawing the project was also using, using these, in a way, lines to give it, to give it uh, mass, right? To give it like a hatch, yeah. Like, you know, we use these hatches. So this kind of led to this concept of the roof is not flat or uh, smooth, but it could be also a kind of a hatch, a kind of a space. Uh, and so it started like that, but then it became more interesting because sometimes the lines are, are complete, but sometimes the lines are, are open, or sometimes the lines are glass, right? And sometimes the lines in between are soil, so you get plants. So the roof becomes another project, you see, another kind of project that, uh, that has different conditions on it, right? Some vegetation, some pergola some openings, and maybe you can go on the roof and also do some gardening if you like, right? You know, steps is not a new idea. We have many buildings that are structured in that way by big steps. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a theme that I, I enjoy very much, the idea that the roof is another kind of public space. This is a... Uh, leads in a way as a conversation between my own projects, lead in a way to another project, uh, which a competition for the National Library of Israel, which we won a few years ago. Give me a second for a... Um, so the context here, uh, this is in Jerusalem, where stone is a dominant element. Uh, it's a very central uh, site. But as you enter into, into a competition like this, and this is a competition for a national library, you have to ask, you know, what does it mean to have a library in the 21st century? A library historically is this building that holds knowledge, right? That holds books, objects. But today, knowledge, uh, you know, where is knowledge today? It's in the cloud, it's, no, it's nowhere. It kind of asks you that, but then it's also interesting to do that in a place like Jerusalem. So in a way, the, the question of how knowledge is um, uh, collected and transferred so we, it's, it's really interesting, these two images, you know, in English we call them tablet, I guess in Polish as well. They're both tablets. They are different, obviously, 4,000 years of difference. But what I, uh, I like about this comparison is uh, in the way that they are similar, because they both have the same form. You see, the form didn't really change much. They're both the same size, because also our hands did not change much uh, in, in the past 5,000 years. Uh, and they both are used to basically send information, convey information. So I, I started thinking about the, the, the project in that way, that the form is not about the knowledge that it contains, but it has to do with something else, with another scale, or with another element, right? And this historic example of a library, which is uh, really this kind of temple that lions guard and inside maybe you see the sky and you have to be quiet, right? This, uh, these ideas maybe need to be kind of challenged now. And the context of the city of Jerusalem is also interesting and informs a lot the, the design or the kind of the dialogue between the form. As you see, uh, the old city of Jerusalem is here. Then the the city past the walls, a 19th century city, is over here. And further out, this is like the 20th century city, right? When I say the 20th century city, a series of large buildings, it's a government district scattered kind of in the landscape. You see the old fabric of the old city where 
you know, small alleys in between the walls, you leave the walls, you enter the 19th century city, and then you move into the kind of the modernist concept of a government district, buildings scattered kind of in the landscape. This is the I Israeli parliament. This is the Supreme Court, you know, ministries, offices, etc. The context of Jerusalem is contested. It is a conflicted zone, right, between blue areas controlled by the Israeli state. The brown and the yellows are under the Palestinian Authority. In this case, so you see, it's not, does not really belong to one. It's really an area that, that has a lot of um, conflict. And that conflict, again, is part of what is shaping the city, of these different architectures, you know, of the Jewish architecture here and the Palestinian architecture. And they're very different, they collide. And it's important to understand this context in order to understand the design because this, we're not designing in a vacuum, we're designing in a place that I know this reality, you see. I know the reality of architecture being used to create barriers, being used to create walls from houses, from stone, from concrete. Uh, so it's not only these kinds of walls, it's also walls created by buildings. Buildings also create barriers, borders. Uh, boundaries. And the, the idea of the vertical barrier, the separation, the segregation is not between two countries, is within the city in different places. So Jerusalem is a city of constant barriers, of constant vertical walls that don't allow you to move from one space to another. And knowing, knowing the city, the idea here was to try and to create a structure which is completely horizontal. It, it has no vertical divisions. It has no barriers. You can walk through it. You can walk in it. It's, it's completely flat, yeah? But it cannot be completely flat. It's, uh, it's a topography. It's a hill. Uh, it's, it's a landscape that does, does not allow you to do it f completely flat. So this is where the idea of a split ground, right, where the ground kind of splits comes to. You see the, the, the kind of the section through, through this part of, of the landscape of the city. And as uh, the building, you meet the building, the, the ground kind of separates to go under and to go above, right? And this idea translates into a section, a building section, where you have the ground you go, you begin to go down and down, but at the same time here you can go up and up and so forth. And this informs the section and this informs the structure and this informs the shape. And obviously as you can imagine by now, it's maybe rare not to have a building with a courtyard or let's say when you have a courtyard, you know at least something is potentially gonna be successful. <laughs> in a way, because you, you, you preserve that space and you bring that space into the building. So it is also organized around courtyards. But before that, it is about the landscape. It is about an interpretation or a dialogue with the existing landscape, the existing landscape of, of the hills of the city, which human intervened in, but it's also an existing landscape of steps which the city historically had, as you can see in, the, in that image. But it's also a dialogue or conversation with the idea of carving into that rock, into that space. So the project, as it develops, is looking to capture this movement of walking up, but also the carving of, of these courtyards, of these spaces. So the model, uh, the, the, the project, as you see, is made up of four courtyards. They're connected by stone steps. They allow this kind of additional movement of up and down. Uh, a beautiful work by like James Turrell here is an inspiration for that. But also an ancient, what we call a mikveh, space for bathing. 
in, in Jewish religion is also kind of echoed in this kind of space. And it, it captures what is so typical also of Jerusalem, that in this city, you are either below or above. You know, you can, this is how you enter the city and this is how you leave the city. Uh, in myth and in reality, in the old city, you are under or you are above. This movement, which is characteristic of the city, between below and above. So you are under in a space or you are above it at the same time, right? The other element that this scheme allows to develop is the concept of different programs. Like I mentioned before, a library is not, in our century, just a place to hold books or to hold knowledge. It's a place of interaction, of exchange, of culture, of community. So here, there is a reinterpretation of the program. And you see the four colors represent different kinds of programs, but different degrees of openness. So the first area or the first courtyard is open 24-7. It would have a restaurant or a bar or a cafe. The next courtyard is open to everyone. You don't need to go to the library. It has a gallery, it has an auditorium, it has an art space, right? exhibition, etc. Then only the third courtyard is a reading room. is where you would come to get a book, to read a book. And then the fourth is the administration and a music center. So as you kind of progress, right, it, it becomes, it, it starts with being completely public and then more, and then also a, a high degree of, of publicness and then it gradually becomes more kind of uh, closed. So again, I, I want to show here that the, what starts from a concept of a landscape and steps and translates into organizational element of courtyards, then translates into program, and now translates also into structure. Because structurally, you see the different structural systems at play. The red is an independent structure, very heavy to hold just the stone, but also to allow light. And then the blue can be a much more regulated structure that will hold cars, people's paper, books, furniture, etc. And the two structural systems that are one in, in the other. And so often it's not, we can't solve a project necessarily by one structural system. So we need to also be aware that it could be quite inventive to use multiple structural systems when you, we know why, why we do that, right? It, it kind of all, uh, is combined in the plan, and the plan brings everything together. You can see the section remains the same, and the plan kind of develops as, as you move into the different kind of levels of the building. And this is a play on a continuous space, but also space that has different kind of degrees of, of intimacy, because the plan itself is very large. But if we look at the cross sections, you see that every courtyard creates its own space around it, and this is in sequence from the first one to the next, to the, to the bigger one, and then to the back. Right? So they're all connected, but they also at the same time create the sense of, of intimacy around the courtyards and in, in renderings. You see how that kind of develops in space. So I, I'm including this project here because I want to show in a different context another kind of interpretation of similar ideas. And we have, we have, some, we have more time, yes? We're OK? Yes? We, we, have, we have some? Oh, super. Uh, so the co a competition for uh, the Guggenheim Museum in, in Helsinki was a different kind of context uh, that, that had the challenge of uh, an urban fabric that meets the water 
and the site was given is marked here in red. So the same kind of uh, exercise, but not with the landscape uh, of Jerusalem, but with an urban fabric of a city like Helsinki around a port, right? And here we have a perimeter block system that, you know, a perimeter block has a building around and has courtyards in it. And this was the attempt to create a, a building that its geometry parts from the fabric of the city. It follows, but it parts for it because it has to respond also to the port. But then it captures some of the courtyard conditions uh, that th that fabric has. More so, it tries to make that connection between a park which is elevated and and a platform which sits on the water. So another response in a way to that question, what can a building uh, give the site and what can the site give the building? And in this case, a passage between the park and the port and the kind of a boardwalk along the port, which is open and free. And you could do that without going into the museum. You could do it on the roof or within the structure, but you don't need to walk in it. And the section helps to make that happen. And so you can see with the entrance, you go up the stairs and you begin to walk inside but outside the building to the park. And the interior obviously is uh, gallery spaces. It's, uh, it's the Guggenheim which was not built and will not be built in Helsinki because of resistance to, to having the Guggenheim conquer another city. Uh, maybe against the Bilbao effect, right? But nevertheless, you see uh, the, the kind of the, the, the uh, operations in the, in the construction of an, that additional structure, whether it's a museum or another institution, it still creates something that belongs to the city and not just to the function of the building. Um, I will conclude with this project, which is probably the most uh, complex uh, in a way that I've been engaged in. And it's complex not because just of the architecture, but because of the whole concept, which is a building in its concept that is completely new. And we do not really have an example of it, or we do not have uh, um, a precedent to look at and to learn from in terms of what it's intended for and how it's, it's functioning. And we call this, uh, we call this project Care House, uh, and it is a, what we call a care-based co-housing project. And to explain it very simply, it's a, it's a residential building that elder people live in and the caregivers that take care of those elders also live in the same building, but in separate apartments. Uh, and it creates a condition that basically the elders and the caregivers meet in shared spaces and collective spaces that they, they share. And these are spaces that the caregivers can support the elders. But at the same time, the caregiver does not live inside the unit of, uh, of the elder person that needs care, but also the elders are not in an institution. And in the US, uh, the, the very extreme condition that if you are old and you need care, you either go to uh, an institu a nursing home or, or assisted living, where it's like an institution, you know, you have your room and you have your staff and nurses, etc., or you bring someone into your house. And that's complicated because one, you know, our houses are not designed for that, but also life is not really uh, designed for that because there's a lot of abuse between and there's also real problems that let's say you need to lift someone from the bath and you're alone and you need help and you're, or you need to go out to get medicine and you know, want to leave the old person alone in the unit. So, in the U.S., it's these two conditions, and, and there, is, there is a need and, and demand to come up with more 
let's say, solutions for care. This is what this project is trying to do. You see, the architecture is only part of it. It's a project that relates to a growing crisis uh, in the US that more and more people would need care and more and more people will not be able to afford it. But it's also a problem of the caregivers. And this is typical to many Western countries in general that there is a demand for caregivers, but these caregivers are earning very little money and are changing jobs very rapidly because they have no incentive to stay. So there is a project here that, that in order to develop this concept, there's a lot of research about caregiving, about elder, about senior condition in the US, and uh, more specifically about, let's say, the place that we are working in now, which is Baltimore in the state of Maryland. It's near Washington, DC. So there's a lot of components that we study in order to understand how to develop this concept. For example, what we call the social determinants of health. How important it is for old people to be in a social environment to improve their health, right? So there are many studies about sociability, about interaction, and how, how important that is not being alone for your health. So this project we, we developed um, as I, as an architect, working with an artist filmmaker, uh, Marissa Moranjan, who is in a way an expert on care and has been working on care, and with a developer local to Baltimore, Ernst Valerie, who works on developing um, projects that have a social kind of enterprise or a social impact. And the vision was, as I'm describing, to create a space that older adults and disabled people can live together, but also engage with, with caregivers, and caregivers have their own kind of space for themselves and their families in the same building. It uh, makes care more dignified, and it gives the caregivers stability. So this project doesn't only look at the elders or the old people, but also looks at the caregivers. And how does it work? Uh, so financially, the elders would pay a kind of rent for their unit, but that money goes into paying salaries for the caregivers and also subsidizing the caregivers' rent. And the ratio is around, in this project, there are 21 apartments. About uh, 16 would be for elders, about four for caregivers, and one is like a house manager. You know? And the project is located in Baltimore, in a neighborhood that has a lot of vacancy, in a neighborhood that um, we could buy also land for cheap, uh, a site here that was an abandoned uh, a row house, right? And kind of the removal of these abandoned row houses and uh, replacing them with, with a care house, with a five-story building that has retail and commercial space on the ground level and has apartments in it. The concept behind this design is, relates to many of the needs of senior people, older people that need, that need help, that need care, but also for caregivers. It also addresses how to design for small units and how to design, in a way, units or apartments that have a different kind of interaction with the corner, with the street corner, right? Like very big windows that each unit would have one of these windows that would look at the corner. And then it has a central courtyard where everyone can kind of gather. The other component is really a design idea. How do you break the, the image, the stigma of, oh, a house of old people, you know? Oh, this is where old people live. It's usually very institutional and boring and dull and not visually interesting. So this is also an attempt here to make a design that kind of challenges that and says, oh, this is kind of hip, cool, more interesting space, more dynamic space. Even if it's old people, it doesn't mean that uh, they, they are not interested in design or in this 
uh, kind of ability to have a place that is more engaging, visually stimulating. So the process involved a lot of discussions, a lot of uh, conversations with, uh, with doctors, with nurses, with caregivers, with older people, and a series of uh, plans that were kind of back and forth in conversation to get input. I will show you the plans. This is going into construction uh, this year, this project. But what, what you will see in the set of plans is that, that pink space, which is, which is a shared space, which is in the center of the building, and it moves across the different plans. So there are no corridors. There is a shared space from which you enter apartments, and that shared space is open into a courtyard and, uh, and terraces. And you see, as you go up that space, the building steps back and allows more light and air in. Uh, and every one of these spaces has a different program or function. Uh, so one would be a, a kitchen, one would be a reading room, one would be a garden, uh, interior kind of greenhouse, one would be an art space, etc. And so the, the structure which is very uh, clear in terms of that setback of space now begins to kind of develop an envelope or a language of openings that kind of changes and, and turns the, the project into a much more dynamic kind of condition. As you can see, the steps, the step kind of shared spaces in the middle, connected by an interior stair and an exterior stair, and terraces and the units kind of organized around. And every level has a theme. It has a theme of use, but also a visual theme. Because one of the things, for example, that we relate to is um, vision loss and orientation that, that old people also have. That you need a distinction between the floor and the wall to orient yourself, or that every floor gets a different color so you remember where you are. What can we do? It happens that you forget, you know, uh, dementia, it's called, more and more people have it, right? So how can architecture design begin to relate to these real problems of age? So here is where Marissa's work comes in, in terms of art of creating these wallpapers, these interiors that you see make a difference between a wall and a floor that create highlights. So every floor of the project of this shared space gets a different color, a different pattern, a different story. It's also a way to capture stories that belong to this neighborhood or belong to this community. Stories of, of women that were in the community and served the community, or stories of um, famous singers like Billie Holiday that came from this town. Here you see an installation that shows two levels in one-to-one -one scale of the interior space of the project, each in a different color, each with a different pattern, each with a different story. So what I, I want to show here is really that these ideas translate through form, through sight, through structure, through envelope, onto interior, and eventually can impact and inform even you know, the kind of paint that we use on a wall, or what we call these kind of wallpapers, or the images that the final kind of component of a space, which is really just that, that thin layer of paint or of color. And maybe to leave you with one kind of statement, uh, something that I, I hope you don't forget or you believe in as well, that what we do is aspires to be an art uh, and in a way an art of giving form to space that is uh, for, for human habitat, but human habitat that also responds to social and, and environmental conditions. So with that, thank you.